Today we are going to talk about the Buddha, and uh, I'm your humble art stop lecturer today. Um, Sonia is not able to be with us, but her and I have talked a little bit about Buddhism, and so I'm going to give you my take on it, and hopefully it's, um, <laughs> it's something close to what she would tell you. Um, so, Buddhism. The thing about talking about the Buddha in Asian art is actually it's kind of comparable to talking about depictions of Jesus in Western art. So when we're, when we're talking about Buddhism what, in, in art, what we're really talking about, what's really fantastic is we're literally looking at this image that seems sort of unchanging, right? In the same way that we know what, what Christ looks like and we can recognize him. When we go to a painting, we understand, okay, that's a picture of Jesus and we know who that person is. Here, again, you have this Buddha image sort of repeated over and over and over. Come on, folks, come on through, it's okay. Um, you have this Buddha image repeated over and over and over again. And when you look at how it changes over time or the different elements of it, what we're witnessing are different things happening in history, in cultures, and we can understand all of that just by looking at the progression of this one image throughout time. Um, so just like uh, Jesus, since we're making that, um, that relationship. Come on through, come on, it's all right. It's a public institution. Uh, so when, when we're making that comparison, again, uh, this is, Buddha is based on a historical figure. Does anybody know who this historical figure might be? There we go, Gautama Siddhartha, uh, fit, approximately fifth century BCE. Um, he is the most unlikely character to end up being a religious leader. Um, he, come on through, come on through. He is the most unlikely person to be a religious leader because he's a prince. He's wealthy, he's got it made, and the, the story goes, I'm sure um, Mark knows this very well, but the story goes that he, you know, somehow gets outside the palace walls and he sees all this suffering going on outside the palace and it really impacts him. And so he decides he's going to renounce his wealth and his nobility and he's going to go out into the world to seek enlightenment. Now. It is no mistake that the first thing that you see when you come in to the whole Asian wing of the museum is a story from the life of the Buddha. Um, what we have here is actually sort of the, the genesis moment here, um, if you will, for the birth of Buddhism. Here we have the prince. He is on horseback and he is sneaking out of the palace. This is the moment where he is going to leave his like I said, his life of nobility behind. Now, I have seen a lot of statues where you might see a Buddha or even a Bodhisattva and they're stepping on someone, which is usually a, a sign of stepping on ignorance, crushing ignorance. So when I first saw this, I thought that that might be the case because you have these horse hooves and they're literally on the shoulders um, of these two individuals right here. These are actually earthly um, deities and they are carrying the hooves of the horse because the horse's hooves, that clatter, would have alerted the palace guards that somebody was nearby and they would have stopped the prince from, from leaving. So they are actually carrying the horse so that the nearby guards won't know that uh, the Buddha is trying to sneak out. Um, right here, we have uh, another deity holding a, this would be a parasol, right here that's a little broken off. Right here, we have one holding um, a fly, some fly whisks. Um, and in general, you just have all these deities that are getting together. They know that this guy is, gonna, is bound to be a great spiritual leader. So they're all around him, encouraging him to, to leave and go on his journey um, and supporting him the whole time. So you have this, like I said, sort of like moment of the birth of Buddhism. The, the religion doesn't exist yet, but this is the moment when Prince Siddhartha is leaving um, to go seek enlightenment. So we're going to move over to this case right here. We have a whole bunch of depictions of the Buddha, but from very, very different um, time and place. So we've talked about, we've talked about this tale from the, his biography, from the life of the Buddha, but what I want to do right now is just talk a little bit more about how are we going to uh, recognize the Buddha. So, and Mark I'm sure could, could blurt these out really fast, um, but and Mark, if you want to, you can. 
But we want to talk about four main signifiers of the Buddha. And well, Mark, maybe you'll start us off with one. We know the snail shell hair. Yes. Um, and, and there's some different uh, myths about that. The one that I read, Mark, uh, is the first time that the prince cut his hair, it sort of all sprang into these spirals and never needed to be cut again. Um, but yes, go, you're on a roll. Okay, but, but the, the most prominent, well, there are several, there are four different um, attributes. The most prominent are his very long ears. We saw him as a prince over there, he lived in a palace. And he wore lots of jewelry and a lot of heavy jewelry that hung from his ears. So when he became enlightened, he became a monk and went out and he became enlightened. He, before he even did, he gave up all his jewelry. But it was too late. His ears were already stretched out. Thus, he's got elongated ears. Absolutely. So we've got some very long ears. Um, we've got this tightly cropped, um, curly hair. Um, the eyes. A lot of people think that these, these eyes are closed on the Buddha and that he is sleeping or that he's in a meditative state. Meditative state, that's kind of intuitive, that makes sense. Um, what it really means, or, or sorry, his eyes are actually not closed. They are looking down because he's in this meditative state. So he's very much awake, he's just concentrating. Sometimes you will see him uh, you know, possibly reading something, but mostly that is about a meditative state, but the eyes are not closed. Um, he is looking down. Um, and something that I really want to bring up, because it's not actually that evident on these, is something called an urna. And a lot of times you'll see that um, in between the eyebrows, um, either as a tuft of hair, or sometimes um, there could even be a jewel inserted um, into that part of a, a statue. In these Thai depictions of the Buddha, and we're in the 15th to 17th century with these sculptures right here. Um, you don't really see that. Uh, the eyebrows have been exaggerated, so they almost come into each other, but you don't really see a very pronounced urna. Um, but something that I'm sure Mark is dying to talk to us about is the Ushnisha. ushnisha. So would you like to explain that, okay. Mark? Uh, his, ushnisha is his wisdom bump. He's a very wise man, and, and he's got a bump on the top of his head to, to uh, in which he stores all of his wisdom. And this particular Thai art, which is very unique, by the way, you know, Thailand uh, has its own unique art. He's got a flame on top of his Ushnisha. That's a flame of wisdom. And that's something you'll see mostly in Thai art. Uh, but the urna is not there. I'm trying to see if there's an urna on one of these others. Maybe yeah, you don't really see him in, in the Thai depictions not at, at all. all. The urna isn't there, and it's probably in this one. Yes, yes, you do. Yes, mm -hmm. there is a nerve right there. Yeah. And, this, and this has all of the same attributes. The snail shell here, the Ushnisha, the long ears, the urna. Uh, and of course, he's sitting in a, uh, in a meditative pose, and he's sitting under the Bodhi tree, the tree in which he became, under which he became enlightened. Uh, he's got his hands in gestures. Uh, this is his, uh, his left hand. Like that, that's a meditative gesture. And his right hand, he's reaching down and, t and touching the earth. That's called Bhumi's um, Pasha, which, which is earth touching. He's calling the earth to witness his enlightenment. And that's what that, that is all about. And those are called uh, mudras. And just are called mudras. <laughs> so so um, you see that even with a very standard set of aesthetic decisions, okay, the image of the Buddha, there's actually a lot of variation. And this flame that Mark talked about coming out um, of, the, of the top of this you know, bump of knowledge, uh, that is actually something that the Thai culture learned from Sri Lankan depictions as early as the 8th century of the Buddha. The Sri Lankans learned or, or got their imagery of the Buddha from uh, Indians and, and what is now uh, Pakistan. So what we're looking at, like I said, when we, when we start to analyze all these slight differences between depictions of the Buddha, what we're seeing are the spread of Buddhism across Asia. 
starts in India, goes north into modern day Pakistan, Afghanistan, eventually over to Tibet. Um, southward it spreads down to Sri Lanka, then from Sri Lanka over to Thailand, and then the rest of southeastern Asia, and then eventually uh, makes its way over to Japan. So um, we're, we're witnessing history here. Um, how does this spread happen? Well, uh, a couple different ways. The most important way is the Silk Road. So all of this amazing business uh, is starting to, to happen, transnational business, transcontinental business. And it's not just goods that are being transported, but it's ideas. And of course, one of the biggest ideas is Buddhism. So that's sort of how it happens uh, to go from one country to another. But then the other Im important thing is when it goes to a different country, of course, it has to sort of adapt a little bit and adopt the aesthetics and the customs of that country a little bit. And so right here, we can see that all of a sudden, instead of our, instead of our usual, uh, as in this head or, or this reclining figure right here, instead of this tightly uh, curly hair, um, we have a crown again. So what's going on? Because this guy gave up being a prince uh, got rid of all his jewelry, and now he has a crown again. And this um, head right here, similar to that head up there with these, these big crowns, um, this has to do with, an, a, again, another chapter story from the life of Buddha where he's trying to convert this heretical king um, to Buddhism, and in order to do that, he decides that he needs to put a crown on and act very uh, princely to relate to this guy and sort of make him understand that if he gave everything up to, to go seek enlightenment, that this king could as well. So here, um, what you're getting are, again, images of the Buddha, um, but here we can use it to sort of tell a tale. So instead of just being a stand-in for the Buddha, maybe a reverential object, it's also a teaching tool, um, which, and this was very popular uh, in um, Thailand. But the other amazing thing is that before late second, early third century, we don't actually have these figures at all. So when Buddhism starts, um, and, and again, this is fifth century BCE, you don't really have a lot of depictions of the Buddha or the idea of Buddhism in general until maybe first century BCE, but all of those are of an empty throne or just footprints. There's no figure to speak of. Now, where does the figure finally come in? Well, through a couple of different wars around that time, uh, Hellenistic type of cultures and the Greeks outright came into uh, areas that are now Pakistan, northern India, things like that. So some of the first depictions that we have of the Buddha look exactly like Apollo. They look like a Greek god. And it's very slowly over the course of about four or five more centuries where you get a, what we would now consider this more um, standardized Asian um, uh, version of the Buddha. But it started out looking exactly like the Greek gods. And so that's why um, we want to emphasize that just looking at one uh, image over and over again, this image of the Buddha, can actually tell us a lot about the history uh, of not just Central Asia, but really all of Asia uh, by the time we get to uh, the turn of the 20th century. Um, the last thing that I, I will leave you all with is what's really amazing now is the, is the spread of Buddhism in the Western world. So uh, in the last two centuries, Buddhism has really taken off in Europe and now the United States as well. So it's, it'll be interesting to see how we continue portraying the Buddha, um, especially now that we have people in Western uh, cultures getting interested in the religion. So thank you, and thank you to Mark for helping me out with that. Thank you.